in. And the recording's just started, so. So I'll just go on um, to some background about the teaching partnership. Um, so the West Midlands um, Social Work Teaching Partnership, um, can, Adam, can I have the, no, sorry, um, is one of 23 um, accredited teaching partnerships um, funded by the Department for Education. Um, we are the largest teaching partnership in the um, country, um, made up um, of 27 partners, as you'll see there. So 15 um, local authorities, two children's trusts, um, an NHS trust and nine HEIs. Um, and this webinar has been brought to you today through a real um, collaborative partnership working um, across the whole partnership. So this session today has been brought to you um, and has came out of the um, Teaching Partnerships Practice Education Strategy Working Group, where we wanted to deliver a session to team managers or those with supervisory responsibility for a team to improve um, confidence around facilitating student placements on the team, but also to gain a greater, und greater understanding about what's involved um, in practice education. And these both link with our overall aim um, around improving the quality, quantity and sustainability of practice education, in particular um, statutory placements across the West Midlands region. So this links to the practice education and professional standards and um, the PEPs um, and within the PEPs refresh 3.8, um, 0.5 within that, that talks about um, the student's learning being the responsibility of the whole team, not just of the practice educator. I'm going to explore today that whole team around the student approach from various perspectives. So these are um, our presenters today. So I'll just introduce myself. Um, so I'm Laura Carter, consultant social worker with the West Midlands Social Work Teaching Partnership. Um, I oversee the North, um, North sub-region. Um, and we're going to hear from various speakers, as you can see on the slide um, now, and I will introduce them in turn when they're due to speak. We also have with us um, Adam Sayward, Programme Support Officer for the um, Teaching Partnership, who is um, sharing his screen today. So he's in charge of the slides. Um, he will be um, coordinating the chat and um, he'll be helping with the Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to put that in the chat um, and we can come to any questions or comments at the end. Um, so the um, this webinar has been um, delivered in the context of remote working. So um, everything we say just ha have that context to it around um, COVID-19 and student social work placements taking place um, through home working, through remote working. Also, um, the speakers work for various organisations, so information may differ between different organisations. However, we're talking generally about practice education and around placements. So this is the programme um, for the next um, two hours. So we have got a little icebreaker activity to start with. Um, we'll hear from all the speakers and then later on uh, we're going to use Mentimeter to, to complete an activity to complete two questions um, there. So if you can have a device, whether it's the device you're watching the webinar on, um, something with internet access so that when prompted to do so, you can um, go to menti.com and enter the um, code that you're given. Um, so the first um, question we wanted to ask and we, we wanted people to um, put their answers into the slides is around how confident you currently feel facilitating student placements within your team. So we've given some options there. So very confident, confident, not sure or um, not confident with that. And um, we will revisit this at the end of the webinar to um, see, hopefully we've been able to um, increase people's confidence with this um, and it fits in with our overall aim. Um, and it helps us to identify really as a teaching partnership what, what the work we need to explore. So if you want to put in the chat what you where you sit currently um, in those options, um, that will be really helpful.
Uh, so I can see them coming in now. So a lot of confident, very confident. Some not sure. Um, and some sort of in between. So that's that's very reassuring. A lot of people are confident already. With that. So some people are new teams or new circumstances and um, that's sort of affecting the um, confidence. But generally speaking, I think we're, people are um, confident, so that's good. OK, so if you haven't done so, you can continue to put um, your responses in the chat. That's fine and we'll move on um, with the presentation. So first of all, we're going to um, hear from Helen Franklin, lecturer from Keele University, who's going to talk about the university's role in preparing for placements. So over to you, Helen. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Laura said, I'm Helen Franklin. I'm a lecturer at Keele University and I've got responsibility really for overseeing all of the practice learning and placements for our Keele students. Um, just a little bit of background about me. I became a practice educator in 2005 and have worked um, within and supporting student placements both as a practitioner, then within workforce development, where um, I worked at Staffordshire for five years before moving on to Keele. So I've got quite an extensive kind of um, range of knowledge around supporting students um, in placements, either from the workforce development side of things or from the university side of things. So what I wanted to do today was really kind of think about um, just setting the scene really in this particular section around how we go about um, deciding who our students are and how they get to the, the point of actually coming out on placement. Um, so the first thing that we would do is as a university, um, even before we get to the interview process, is that we actually read every single UCAS form as a as a team um, to to sort of look at, you know, what has the student applied for? What is their understanding and knowledge about social work and have they kind of showing a little bit of potential even at the point of writing their personal statement um, that they are you know they they know what they are applying for in terms of applying for social work if that's satisfactory um, then we move that stage forward to an interview process um, the interviews and selection day process at Keele and I think across the teaching partnership we've done quite a lot of work um, in terms of the nine universities um, we look at um, what we look at is um, a standardisation. Really, we've we've looked at that to sort of think about: are we all are we all doing the same thing when we're selecting our students? Are we all looking at the same thing? Are we asking similar questions? So there is a standard process again across the nine universities in the teaching pro partnership. Um, so we are looking at. Um, within that selection process at a written task. So how well does a student write before they come to university? So what are we, uh, what are they able to do? What's their potential in terms of their written work? We look at their ability to work with others um, and that's working as kind of a group with other candidates. Um, we look at how they work together, they're able to discuss things. We give them a social work related topic to discuss. And so within those discussions, we're looking at their values, whether there's any quite significant statements that are being made that might kind of make us feel a little bit uneasy about or unsure about that student. Um, so we are looking, you know, at a range of things. And then we move to an individual interview. Certainly what Key will do, and I'm sure that in many other um, universities will do this as well, is actually invite practitioners to become part of that interview process. So not only are we looking at this from an academic point of view, we have a service user on the panel um, interviewing our potential students and we will also have a practitioner who is looking at the, the potential student and looking at you know how they're able to, uh, whether they're able to kind of um, 
meet the criteria to go on to a social work course. So it's really helpful, I think, you know, if you have anybody on your team who's expresses an interest, a practice educator, for example, expresses an interest to become part of a university panel, um, selection day panel, it's really good experience, but it also helps us to make sure that, you know, we are recruiting students that our local authorities and our agencies are also satisfied um, that they meet a certain benchmark criteria before moving into the university to study social work. We assess the candidates that we're interviewing against the entry level of the professional capabilities framework. So that is a very kind of low level um, part of the PCF. It is very much a general awareness, um, some kind of some values there that you know we can build on as they, they develop their learning it is a very much kind of a, a, a low level um as i said when we're doing our interviews we're looking at the potential of that student so we are looking at oh um sorry um slide speed then um so we're looking at um, their potential we're looking at their their values we're looking at the communication with others and also then asking them within their interviews you know what kind of experience have they had that, that you know they may feel makes them suitable for social work we'll ask them about what they've read we'll ask them about you know some transferability of life experience that can be quite um low level as well we're not asking them to have had social work input we're not asking them to have had family members that have um, seen social work it can just be can you tell me how you've responded to a challenging situation for example um, and showing some level of transferability at that point. Um, what we're looking at is how do they problem solve? We're looking at how they how they perhaps can do a low level of challenge where perhaps you know views might differ that perhaps that is um, that is maybe a detriment to an ind individual. So it's a very low level, but it's actually showing that potential to for us as a university and for our placement providers to really help to then teach that student and give them that, that foundation to, to build upon. In terms of other aspects of suitability for that student, um, we will do a DBS check right at the outset of the of the, um, the course, and that has to be satisfactory. Um, that doesn't mean to say there's nothing on the DBS. You know, sometimes people have had background history. That means sometimes things have happened in their life and there is something on the DBS. But what we do then is we will check with um, a critical friend sort of looking at you know is this going to perhaps prevent that that student from having access to placements we will look at the student's reflections on you know what's happened in that situation we'll look at all of the circumstances surrounding that and ask the student for more information about that before proceeding to say that student's going to be you know suitable to come on to a social work course um so within that kind of process, if there is something as that fitness to practice assessment that does involve, you know, a conversation with an outside agency as well as our own um, procedures there. Where a student has declared um, some health issues, we will also look at an occupational health check as well, you know, for them that to say, are you physically and mentally ready to undertake the social work course? And again, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that something might happen in the duration of the course. Occupational health is available to all of our students throughout their course and we can, with their, with their consent, make referrals through to occupational health. And those occupational health checks, again, will help us to prepare for placement too. So if a student has any additional needs, they, you know, we can actually sort of look at what occupational health have said to support that student. OK, if I could have the next slide, please. So that's the student getting to the university. So once they start at university, then there are a number of things they will do before placement. Each um, university course will be different. The students will go out at different points on the course. Our students, for example, will go out for, for BA students will go out at the beginning of their second year. Some students will go out later on in their second year. If they're on a master's course, they may be out within the first year of practice. So again, it, there are yeah, differences between how long a person has been um, on the course before that first placement will start. Um, we, the majority of courses, there are some exceptions perhaps on um, some of the more kind of um, fast track courses, for example, uh, but the majority of university based courses will have classroom based skills um, 
or in some, as I say, some instances might be a 30 day contract in learning experience that you may be asked to provide as well um, as, a, as a placement provider. But most of us will go for a classroom based skill session. This um, includes our service user and care group and practitioners um, to support students and a safe environment to develop skills around, for example, interviewing, decision making, making assessments of people, um, thinking about their different forms of communication, communicating um, via telephone, but also, you know, more recently we've had to deliver a lot of this online, so they're beginning to um, think about their online etiquette as well. So where are they in the house? Have they got blurred backgrounds? Are they, you know, can we see their washing in the background? All sorts of things that we're asking them to think about when we're doing the kind of the remote working. Um, so we are looking at classroom based skills. They are then assessed with those um, skills. Um, at Keele, we assess them through a reflective presentation. Other universities may, um, may assess them differently. Um, but they have to pass that module and pass that particular um, particular um, skill skill set in order to proceed on the course and proceed forward to a placement. It's a mandatory part of the course. There is also background academic learning that they will have had um, and that again will, will vary from the level of study that they're on, whether they're on a BA, an MA, um, as to how much they've had and which modules they've had before they come on placement. So, for example, some students may have done um, a theory and methods module before they come out on their very first placement. But also, uh, they have theory and methods after that first placement. They reflect on what they've done on the first placement and begin to apply theory. Um, that, that doesn't mean to say there's no theory in the first year. There is, um, but the, you know, perhaps more formalised um, theory might come a little bit later. So I think what's really important is when you're actually thinking about a student that's coming to the team, is have that conversation with the student about which modules have you studied so far and don't make assumptions about what they should or shouldn't know at that point. Um, it's really helpful to say to that student, what have you done? What have you learned? Uh, you know, where's the baseline there? So have you if, and if you're introducing a particular concept, have you looked at this? Um, and if it hasn't come up in the course, they're not going to know it. So if it's needed for that particular placement, think about how you then provide them with access to that teaching and information around that particular area of practice or topic. Students will then have preparation for practice sessions. Um, so again, that's something that I will do with the Keele students, other universities will do it with their students. I'm very much thinking about how do I undertake a placement? Um, so within mine, I look very much at what is professionalism? What does that mean? Um, we look at boundaries. Um, we look at um, how they might use supervision. Many of our students when they first come on the course haven't had professional supervision in the past before so they're not sure what to expect about that they have different um attitudes or expectations of it so you know what does supervision mean to them we have a look at that and again that's another kind of good question really when thinking about meeting that student for the first time is asking you know what are your experience of supervision what do you expect and again then for their um, final placement, which you know many of you will probably be involved in by the nature of, I guess, most, many of you will come, come from local authority or um, NHS and providing final back placements, is thinking about, you know, there will be a first placement experience that student will have had. So what was that? How did that um, you know, prepare the student as well? So students can share their first placement portfolios with you uh, or with the, you know, with the work based supervisors on the team and the, the people working with that student on the team. So those are available too to help build the knowledge of that student. OK, uh, next slide, please. So I think um, one of the key things when when the student has actually been um, so selected for the team um, or you're beginning to think about um, you know, perhaps a student profile has been sent through to the team. Yeah, member staff might be discussing that with you. They may be just thinking about it themselves and you may have to have a conversation with them before they receive that profile. It's just being really kind of mindful around, you know, cultural awareness um, and any disability or additional needs a student might have. You know, we do have to adhere to the Equality Act. Um, you know, as a social work profession, you know, if we're not able to support people's differences within our workplaces, then you know, we maybe should be asking questions of ourselves. Um, how do we, you know, ensure that we have in inclusivity for students from a range of backgrounds with a range of needs? 
thinking about, you know, as a team manager, you may have done um, training when you're looking at recruitment for staff. You know, it's a very similar kind of um, process when it comes to students. Um, so, um, you know, thinking about unconscious bias, for example. Um, I think one of the things to kind of pick up, you know, so research has shown over the years that um, male students and students from black and ethnic minority backgrounds tend to struggle more um, on placements and within social work courses than students from any other kind of um, any other groups. So it's just something to be kind of mindful of is, you know, how are we promoting inclusivity within the placement? And I can pick up on that when I talk a little bit about, um, you know, supporting students that are struggling um, later on. Um, a point on disability, I'm just conscious of my time. Um, a point on disability, um, if you have a student who has um, a learning support plan and that can include dyslexia, do talk to your workforce development teams um, because they can help to access um, things like um, software that will support that student. Um, so do have those kind of conversations around, you know, how do we get the right software for the students to support them so that they can, we can make those reasonable adjustments. Um, so that's, you know, that's really helpful. Um, and I think a note on learning styles and approaches there as well is that everybody will learn differently. So just be mindful, you know, that perhaps if there's been one student on the team and they've kind of taken the one approach to learning how to, you know, undertake the tasks that are within the team, do be mindful that another student may have a very different learning style and might need to be sort of nurtured in a different way. Um, so that's kind of my, my kind of sort of um, note of caution there really is, you know, yes, we have a very, very diverse range of students and we just need, need to be really mindful of, of that. And I think as a team manager, what you can do is make sure that you're setting some time aside to get to know that student, have those conversations um, and, you know, perhaps sort of think about with your, you know, the staff on your team working directly with that student is how are we kind of supporting perhaps some of the differences between yourselves um, and that student. OK, next slide, please. If I've got one more. Yep. Um, so. Um, this one is just a slide that really just sort of picks up the, the roles really just to kind of um, just be kind of quite key really. So any student who's coming to the organisation will often go through the workforce development. Um, so they will go through the workforce development team and they, that team will have a sort of look at the profiles and, and often will sort of sort out and allocate you know, between the, the different teams where they feel that students may be best placed. Some practice educators and work-based supervisors I know have kind of felt they perhaps haven't had a choice about whether they can or can't accept that student. So again, it's um, again it's something to um, to think about. Um, is can my team actually looking at what the students asking for? Can my teams really provide the student with the the right um, level of support? Um, a note, you know, to say, you know, the practice educator, it may not be you as a manager, but the practice educator takes full responsibility for any student placement. So if they are a, an employee on your team, you know, make sure that you're tapping into to, you know, how that that play whole process is going. Um, and I know Angela is going to pick up on a bit more on this a bit later on when we're talking about how do we select who the practice educators and workplace supervisors are. And the on-site supervisors as well, you know, if it's a separate person to a practice educator, you know, you as a team manager may have accountability for the workload of that team and the work that happens on that team. But you, by virtue of having a work-based supervisor, an on-site supervisor, that work has been delegated to somebody else. So think again about, you know, how am I going to kind of oversee that, but while still allowing that delegation. OK. So I'm going to hand back to Laura now. I know there's quite a few questions in the chat, which I'll have a quick look at. Um, and I know there's going to be time for questions and answers at the end. So I'll try and have a, a think about, you know, how I can respond to that. So hand back to Laura now. Thank you, um, Helen. Yes, we'll pull through questions at the end. That's been um, really helpful insight from a university perspective. So next we're going to um, hear from Sarah Harrison student social worker who's on the step up to social work program who's going to give us um, a student insight so over to you sarah okay um so i was really happy to get involved with this um i'm a course rep 
for the Step Up at University of Birmingham and I'm also the Vice Chair for the Basworth Student and Newly Qualified Social Worker Group. So supporting students is something that I'm really passionate about. So a bit about my experiences. So I'm on my second placement now, um, which is, well, I'm nearly halfway through. Uh, my first placement was in a CWD team and my practice educator was the team manager. So that was a great experience for me because she had a lot of insight into the team, into the cases that each like, person was working. So she was able to direct me to different social workers to get different experiences. This time I've got a practice educator in one team and a practice supervisor in my main team. So I've kind of been dipping into both teams, which is great. And the, the managers have been, you know, really supportive and have been helping as well. Um, I've also spoken to other students because I thought it's good to get a perspective from other people to see how they've been getting on with their team managers. And there was a few positive experiences, but there was also a few negatives. So some of the negatives were one student said that they had spoken to the team manager twice in their first placement. Um, another student said she's in a fast paced team and she doesn't actually feel like a student, so it can be a bit overwhelming for her. And another one said that the, they were in a team meeting and the team manager asked to put the cameras on and then didn't put their own camera on. So, and so there's quite a few things that I think like going forward you know, it's important to build that relationship and help the student to feel part of the team. So one thing that has stuck out to me was team managers not calling the student student. So if they don't remember the name, say I would prefer to be asked what my name is if they don't remember. Um, ensure that the team knows that there is a student in the team and ask them to provide shadowing opportunities where possible. Uh, welcome emails from the team. That was always a great thing for me just so that I could you know, find out who was actually on the team and who I could go to. So, like quite often, like you need to know like who the BSO is, who the admin team are. You know, they it all helps. Um, and maybe have induction time with the team manager so that they can go through that structure and who you need to go to and what happens like if your practice educator or practice supervisor's off, like who you can go to for support. And any team meetings that are happening, I think, should be on a platform such as Teams or Zooms with the, with cameras on, just because it is, you know, a virtual, like now with it being all virtual, trying to see faces is, you know, it does help the experience a lot and help build those relationships. So, all right, I'll hand back to Laura now. Thank you, Sarah. That's such a um, good insight as a student and it's good to hear from um other students about how they found um, their placement experience um, and things that have or haven't worked for them. So next we're going to hear from Rachel Cam, practice educator from Cheshire East Council. So over to you, Rachel. Uh, good morning. So um, as Laura said, I'm a social worker and just to put me in sort of context, I work with adults and older people and most of my experience as a practice educator has been working with students actually in my placed in, within the team. Um, so practice educators have professional standards to work to and which were assessed against during training um, and there's two levels. So they're known as PEPS 1 and PEPS 2. Um, and for the PEPs, there's a statement of values which links with the PCFs and with the Basworth Code of Ethics. Um, there are four domains which set out the standard expected of practice educators. And um, I wanted just to use those four domains to talk about how team managers can support the practice educator in regard to each domain. So domain A is about working with others to organise an effective learning environment. Now, I think that um, team managers have an important role in just creating a culture where students in the team are valued, um, not just as an extra pair of hands, which they shouldn't be seen as anyway, but as someone who will bring what they've learned in university to the team and perhaps at times bring a challenge to how we're working. 
In the early years of my career, I was always excited to welcome students to the team and offer them shadowing experiences. And that's really what led to me wanting to become a practice educator. Obviously, there's some kind of practical things that we need to do when preparing to have a student with the team, um, such as getting computers and phones organised and ID badges, email addresses, etc. And so having your support is um, really important for the practice educator. If you happen to be working from an office, um, uh, depending on the setup, it might be you need to organise a desk for the student. I think probably an awful lot of people are now hot desk. Um, and so it's then, you know, it might be organising lockers and whatever else they might need. Um, it's really helpful if the team manager can recognise the role of the practice educator in regard to electing to work with a student, which Helen alluded to earlier on. Um, and ultimately, the practice educator needs to have the final say as to whether they can accept a student. So the usual process is, is that we read information about the student, then we have a, an informal telephone discussion with them, and then we meet them informally. And this is under normal circumstances, obviously, um, in order to make up um, the mind. So with the student I'm working with at the moment, um, I went through some of that process. I think we emailed quite a bit and then I met her on Teams. Um, so mostly this hasn't really been an issue for me, but there was one occasion when I discussed having a student with the team manager. And one day I came back to the office from a visit to be told, I've met your student and they're coming. Um, so I had to kind of put the brakes on that and explain that it was really up to me whether or not I, I had them. But I think it was one of those things where she was um, somebody who was funding her own way through um, the, the social work education while while working and there was perhaps a little bit of pressure on the team manager for to take a student on the team and there can be a whole range of reasons why it's not actually appropriate for for us to take a particular student um as it is i did actually take that student so domain b is about teaching facilitating and supporting learning and professional development in practice so the practice educator should know what the student's learning needs are and is responsible for ensuring that those are met. It's important for the students to have opportunities to shadow other people. It isn't always easy to get colleagues to offer these experiences and actually that has been quite a challenge during lockdown. But it is important for students to understand the range of the work that we're undertaking. So meeting you know, a lot of people, different people with lived experience and um, also observing different styles of working is important for their learning. My style of working works for me, but it's not the only style of working. Um, a team manager can help by strongly encouraging all the members of the team to offer shadowing opportunities. And they, they could even make it part of the CPD for all members of the team to, to do that and to um, support other people's learning. In regard to allocation of work, I know what the student needs and it's helpful if I can see unallocated referrals or who needs reviews and to be able to request cases for allocation. It doesn't help if the team manager allocates cases without consulting me and I find out from the student at supervision as the work allocated may not meet their needs or it may overload them. So I tend to reckon on about 10 cases at any one time, no more than that really, depending on the nature of the cases and the nature of the team that the student's working in. Um, I think getting the right balance is important, um, you know, between the team manager and the practice educator, and they kind of need to liaise over, over which cases are to be allocated and the type of work that the student needs. Domain C is about managing the fair and transparent assessment of students in practice. So please bear in mind that the final assessment that the practice educator has to write is potentially quite a big task and quite time consuming. So please don't overload the practice educator with new work when you know that the placement is coming to an end. Also bear in mind that the practice educator will be providing weekly supervision in um, if they're a particular if they're an on-site practice educator and the preparation, the session in itself and writing up is it likely to take up at least half a day. So to get a fair assessment, it's important that we can triangulate 
evidence, so we'll make a judgment based on direct observation, on written work and on feedback, and your feedback of what you've observed of the student is really helpful. Um, and then if a student is struggling, which I know Helen's going to talk about later, I'd just be aware of perhaps negative vibes around about them around the team. Um, it'll help the practice aid educator to manage this if you can sort of put down any gossip and ensure that any concerns being raised are fair and rather than gossiping over the brew area, if you can get people to talk directly to the practice educator um, with any negative or positive feedback for that matter, that is obviously better. And then finally, Domain D is about developing knowledge and continuing performance as a practice educator. So to maintain currency, practice educators need to be working with at least one student every two years as a minimum. So please advocate for practice educators on your team so that they do actually have this opportunity. And um, I mean, for me, my role as a practice educator keeps me motivated and wanting to continue to do the job I'm doing. Um, there's also other ways of maintaining currency, so please encourage that. So, for example, um, I've mentored practice educators in training, I've acted as a work based supervisor and have provided reflective supervision to an ASYE candidate. And those have all counted towards maintaining my currency as a practice educator. We also need continuing professional development like anybody else, so please ensure that we have time to attend courses and conferences and un um, undertake ongoing training. And um, also please ensure that we've got the information about any courses that you're told about, because that may not get to us without you passing it on. So thank you for listening and I'll hand back to Laura now. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Oh, oh. So that's really that's helpful, really helpful. Um, uh, Rachel can you uh, really helpful um, to talk us through um, the PEPs and from a practice educator perspective so we're going to um, go to Helen now back to Helen to talk through um, struggling um, students and how to support um, during that process so over to you Helen OK, uh, so um, I think one of the things that's really crucial, um, I think where practice educators and work-based supervisors definitely you know, do need the support of their team managers is when a student is struggling on placement. Um, I think one of the things that I would say first off is, you know, you'll pick up, um, you know, if there is kind of some issues with the student most of the time, particularly if, you know, when you are on site and office space, I think this is going to be a little bit more difficult when the team is all sort of based from home and not together as a team. Um, I think one of the things I would certainly say, and I'd reiterate what um, Rachel said is, you know, if you have got anybody on your team who is working as a practice educator or work-based supervisor in either separate roles or dual role, is make sure that you are actually on your supervision agenda with that particular member of staff is that you have got that role down there um, and discuss the student placement and how that's progressing with them so whilst you're not necessarily you know taking any any responsibility for the assessment of that student or for you know thinking about you know the, the work opportunities that the student might have at that point you know you are supporting those who, are, who have had that role delegated to them um, so, you know, that that's a really important point is just make sure that's part of their supervision agenda. It's not seen as something separate. Um, and I know that can be, you know, a little bit more uncomfortable, perhaps if, you know, you haven't necessarily done the practice educator um, role yourself. It can feel a little bit more difficult. But I think it's just really important to give that, that member of staff the opportunity to talk about things. So the first thing um, that I want to sort of think about is sometimes when there's a concern around a student is actually identifying there are two types really of um, concern that you might have about a student. The first one is really a student that comes onto placement and there are some quite overt um, fitness to practice issues. Um, it could be just an incident that happens that is quite significant that demonstrates dangerous practice. Um, it could be a behavioural attitudes, that kind of thing, or it could be actually just they are struggling to to sort of to learn or to think about, you know, the, the the workload that they've got. So I think the first thing to think about with your 
or the work-based supervisor or practice educator is helping them to kind of sort of tease out you know what is it that I perhaps I'm worried about that I can't quite put my finger on and is it a fitness to practice issue is it something that you know is you know fundamental and actually you know no, no matter how we think about it this is something that perhaps can't be taught at this moment or is it something that they actually need to learn they perhaps haven't got the base knowledge about that we thought they might have and that actually we perhaps need to think differently about how we teach this particular student this particular area of practice and I think the first thing that has to happen then for any practice educator or workplace supervisor on your team is to sit that student down and to have what we kind of call within practice education more recently is a courageous conversation. It's those difficult conversations you have to give, have with people whereby you're giving feedback that isn't positive, that perhaps is going to be received in a way that you're not sure how, you know, that's that student. And you, you may have done this with members of your own staff. You're not sure how how your feedback is going to be received so you're you know you're not sure um i suppose you know how that that conversation is going to go once that initial concern has been raised so it's having those courageous conversations so supporting that um that work based supervisor or practice educator to do that you might want to think about within your own supervision if that member of staff has come to you for some support or guidance about how why i do that you could think about do we, do we role play this do you want to try having that conversation and explain to me what the issues are. So again, you have got a role there. So although you may not be the person having that conversation with the student at that point, you might want to think about, you know, how do I support somebody else on my team to have that particular conversation? Um, so the, I think it's really important that we have those conversations early on. So as soon as those um, those issues have cropped up, those conversations need to be happening. The longer an issue is left, the more difficult it becomes and the more entrenched it becomes in that student's practice. So the, the section I've kind of moved on to next is really thinking about within your team is how do we action plan for some of those smaller challenges? Um, if it is, it's something that the student just needs some support to really understand and start going with the, with the task. Uh, we need to think about how do we action plan for those challenges? And I tried to think about this in a way that um, I was trying to think of, you know, kind of think of a model or something that's easy to remember. And I was sort of thinking about words beginning with C, as you can see here. So we started with courageous conversations. But the first thing um, that I thought about is clarity. So being really clear with that student what the issue is. Um, don't skirt around the edges, you know, be, have that kind of real definite. This is what, what the situation is. You know, whether it be, you know, meeting time scale, standards of written work, um, there have been students been observed and perhaps hasn't been asking the probing questions that are needed in, in a safeguarding assessment, for example. Be really clear about what is it that I'm concerned about. The second point there is consistency. So once you know you've you've got that kind of that clarity of that, it's being consistent really in terms of the approach. So, you know. I think, um, as I said, Rachel sort of said about those kind of negative vibes on the team and things like that. You know, it's about making sure that there's a consistent approach with the students so that, you know, if they're asking for information, they're having the same information. Um, you've not got people on the team saying, you know, actually, I really get on well with this student. I don't think there's anything wrong with their, their practice. But you may have somebody else on the team who's saying, I really don't like their approach to this or what they've said. So you sometimes can get friction on the team. And I think what we need is a very kind of consistent team approach and that might be your role then as the as the manager of that team to think about how do I get everybody on board you know to support the student but in a consistent way because it isn't helpful for people on the team that just says I don't know what they're talking about you're doing fine you know because if there is has been an actual issue there so you know thinking about I suppose without um without breaching confidentiality or anything like that, but thinking about, OK, this student needs some support to learn around this. Who can help that student and in which ways um, without, you know, having to sort of be really negative about um, about the student. The next part I said is about construction, and that for me is about building the blocks then to for that student to learn the particular task or process. And you might want to deconstruct that first. So you may have had an expectation that that student could just do something. And actually, when you've it's come to it that students really struggle because there perhaps is a missing building block there. They perhaps haven't had the knowledge or the opportunity to 
see somebody do something in practice or they haven't had the opportunity to perhaps have a conversation of, with somebody that they've observed about why that person has perhaps done something in a particular way. Um, so just sort of thinking about how we construct those learning blocks and building blocks for that student to be able to do that task. So it's building it very carefully for the student. And the next part I then thought was about continue. So once that, that learning need has been addressed, don't keep dwelling on it, don't keep going back to it. If the student's managed and overcome that particular hurdle, the last thing that student needs is for that hurdle to be brought up at every supervision or every um, thing. So thinking about how we move and progress things forward. So once they've come across that hurdle, you know, what's the next challenge or how do they then extend that learning and that knowledge? Um, don't keep reflecting back on over it and make the, the student feel kind of, oh, this is always going to be hanging over me throughout this placement. OK, next slide, please. So the next bit then is if this, the concerns become more significant. So we've perhaps tried the small sort of tasks within the within the organisation to try and help that student learning. And again, sometimes you might go straight to this this part if there's a if there's significant and dangerous practice that you are concerned about that student continuing on the team. And that's about getting the university involved. And I think the key thing to remember, you know, that um, as a team manager, saying to your practice educator and work based supervisors who may be on the team is remember you're not in this alone. The university tutor is there to support the students as well. You know, go to them if you have any concerns, go to them for some support. Um, Sometimes, you know, we find, and I've certainly noticed this when I'm sort of looking at reviewing and evaluating placements with the forms that come back, is often people aren't aware of the role of the tutor or how they could have actually um, used the tutor for support um, at that point. You know, it comes back as quite a sort of a low score. So I've been really sort of trying to push forward, you know, to say to people, you know, go to that tutor, ask, you know, questions. It doesn't mean that this, we're going to jump straight in necessarily and go to a concerns meeting or anything like that. Sometimes just that conversation with a tutor or the practice learning coordinator within the university can help with either a different strategy. If a student's struggling due to motivation or their mental health, you know, it might be they put in an additional tutorial for that student to have a conversation with them and support them um, from a different way, in a different way. Ultimately, though, if the student's really struggling and you have got significant concerns about the continuation of this placement and how the student's able to um, evidence the, their, um, what they, their capabilities against the, the PCF framework, is that we can go to a formal concerns meeting and the tutors will be involved in that. They will support that meeting. Um, the university will also offer the student the opportunity to have some support from a university rep there. Um, so we can think about... Um, can think about how different ways that the university can support that student as well. Often within those, if you know the student isn't, if the placement isn't terminated straight away because there are other things that we can do and really action to help the student meet those PCFs and that their practice isn't dangerous per se, it just means bringing up to standard, um, that we have, that we can do a formal action plan that will then have a review within you know a set time period. So that could be two or three weeks and they're given specific tasks to do within that action plan. And I think what's really important for you as a team manager is if it has got to that point, you know, that you're aware of that, you're aware of what the action plan is so that you're not perhaps giving the student different deadlines, different um, tasks to do, um, anything that might sort of um, jeopardise the plan that they've been given because you weren't aware of what was in that plan. And again, that's another reason why, you know, it's really important to keep involved with supporting the staff on your team that are working with that student. And then finally, if the placement is terminated, the student isn't successful. Universities will have internal processes that will look at, you know, appeals against, you know, decisions. So that might be second opinions. Um, we might be going to a fitness to practice proceeding within the university, looking at that student's suitability for social work overall. And your practice educators and work based supervisors may be asked to provide evidence within those processes. So it's really important that you know you're aware again of some of the additional stress that that might cause for those practice educators. And I think that links to my next point there, really around the emotional impact on the team, you know, and the emotional impact on the personnel around them is did we fail that student? You know, you will have your work-based supervisors and practice educators on the team questioning their own practice if the student hasn't been successful. Did I do enough? Was my supervision adequate enough? Did I give them enough opportunities around those? particular um, tasks. 
it is a very difficult process, both for you know, with supervisors, practice educators, but actually as a team as a whole, those questions can be asked. Um, you know, did we fail that student? And I think as um as a team manager, you know, your responsibility at that point is to kind of think about how do I bring my team back together and rebuild so that we can feel confident to provide an, another student placement. You know, we're not beating ourselves up that we did anything. Um, you know, untoward. You know. Um, that we did everything we could to support that student and to put that learning in place for that student. So I think that was kind of, you know, it's really important to think about that impact um, and how you as a manager bring together and debrief that team to support that team um, and rebuild after, you know, a difficult student placement. But all of that said, you know, students who struggle you know students who struggle and have little challenges yes that's fairly you know frequent common but it doesn't often get to the stage of formal university involvement and that concerns meetings and suspensions and terminations of placements so you know i don't want you to sort of leave you and go away with this thinking oh gosh this is a really big process that i'm going to have to be involved in you know it is sort of the few and far between can't say it never happens but it does happen from time to time and i suppose just being mindful that when it does happen you know that you know you can get some support um, but also think about you know as a team manager you can also go to that workforce development team in your organization for additional support with that too okay so i'm going to hand back to laura now thank you helen that's really helpful to hear about um when students struggle and how a team can um overcome that and to support the um student but also the team members so we're next going to hear from Angela Whitford, Workforce Development Manager for Solihull Council, who's going to give an organisation perspective. So over to you, Angela. OK, hi, everyone. Hi. And that in real brief and that I've been a practice educator now for about eight, 18 years and that so and I've worked both in adults and children's and then more recently in workforce development itself. And uh, so, um, so, so yeah, so quite a bit of experience there, but one of the things that I still really love and feel passionate about is being a practice educator, because I think we can know all of us and that brings so much into practice education. And it's just, um, you know, a really positive part, part of uh, our, our career for us all, hopefully. And that, so just, it, it yeah, and that going on from exactly what Helen was saying, we have, I think all of us will have at some point had, you know, students who need some additional support, who need to, who, you know, are struggling and that. But at the same time, we also have many workers who come into our teams and that many students and that and do, you know, a really great job. And that so so to hold on to, to both sides. And that so when we're looking at anybody in your team becoming a practice educator, or if you're here just thinking about it yourselves. And that I think there's kind of probably two two main aspects of being wanting to do practice education. It's on the one side, it can really feel as though it or it does develop yourself as well as a student, and that when you're a practice educator, and that every time I have a student, and that I feel I am learning from that experience as well as the student learning. And that so it really, you know, does promote your own learning. I feel it brings each for myself, it really it brings you up to date with what the latest aspects in social work are. I know we should all be there, <laughs> whichever. And that, but for for many of us, it might have been a few years since you know you were last at kind of in university yourself or something. And that so it just brings us kind of on top of what the latest information is for the PCF, for the KSS, for any kind of theory that are there for all learning aspects and that student will bring bring that in and that for yourself as a practice educator and, and I'm going on to say for the whole team as well and that because I think you know many students come with different um you know highlighted areas that they're very good at and then you can ask them to develop that and bring it into a team meeting and that and just again that the learning for the whole team can be there so i think you know the, that's another real positive hopefully that you know people can feel that they gain from being a practice educator i think for for many others as well and that i personally and that i've tried to bring it bring it into Sol hill and other areas is I feel that we should all all have, uh, have practice education before we kind of develop on to being a, a manager in a, in ways and that. 
only the only reason I really say that it gives you that absolute fantastic experience of the one to one supervision and being able to do supervision at a really very good level. And that, you know, when you're a team manager, as I'm sure I know, you know, you know, you have a team of 10, 10, 10, 20 people, it might be. And that's so you're doing supervision. I'm sure doing supervision really well. Practice education just gives you that very initial experience of having one person that you're supervising. You're looking in, in real depth in the, with the supervision of what theory is and that bringing up so many different aspects into supervision that is just done at such, as I say, a really positive level. And then from as you're undertaking practice education, what the university will provide to you is really lots of knowledge about what you know good supervision is and how to undertake that. So it's just a really great base to start on and can, as I'm sure hopefully some might do, is that you know real career a real career development and that I've been able to go into practice education, undertake, you know, the 18 months, two years of practice and achieving that. And then for many people to be able to look at becoming, you know, going into a management position as well. And that, so um, for others, as I say, it just gives you that continuous learning. And that, so I think there's kind of, you know, probably two, two angles of people wanting to do practice education. So then the other, the next part of that, and that, so those are both real positives, but the importance of us all working together when we're looking at who, who can become a practice educator and of it being a whole team approach. And that team includes yourselves or your team manager, the practice educator and the social workers, the HEIs, and that workforce development as a practice educator coordinator so everybody working together within this and that it's really isn't a process of any one individual in a team saying oh you know i want to have a student and kind of you know going off in, in one direction it's really about you know whoever uh, thinks that they'd like to do practice education having that discussion and supervision themselves talking it over with their line manager and that thinking through that process, then often with workforce development is in each authority or who it might be who coordinates this and having whenever a student comes and that to a practice education educator, it should again be a whole team. You know, I would really encourage it to be a team discussion of saying and that, you know, ex, ex social worker would like to have a student and that this September, does everybody feel in agreement towards this? And then it's again that shared learning of a, of a student and that so that the student is gaining experience from everybody in the team and that that shadowing experience going out on visits, being able to, you know, hopefully co-work co and, and things like this with, with several people, because as we all know, we all develop and we undertake our practice probably in slightly different ways so a student is able to then gain lots of different information and gain experience from lots of people really and that so it just really and develops their um, learning and I think it develops everybody in the team and then is that really great great part of starting to develop some people who want to go on to practice education as well of just having those first experiences of a student having come out on a visit with them shadowed them just those very first initial steps of what they're able to to start to think about oh yes actually this is something that i really want to develop and want to take forward and that so it really is as i say the whole importance of it being a whole team approach and that for for everybody within this and that to be um, there's very clear eligibility and that criteria for anybody starting on practice education and that's so that again comes within our you know practice um, educator professional standards and that so it's really important for people to be able to to look at that and understand that anybody to do practice education should be have at least been practicing for at least two years and demonstrated really that they're working at a, the PCF experience social work level and they need to be at a, you know, a good level themselves and that so that they're able to really pass on to a student, pass on, develop a student in the best possible way. And that isn't that we want people to be um, yeah, practicing at a, at a good level themselves and then being able to enable a student to be doing to be doing the same and moving towards that. 
during this two year period and that they should be you know, shown that they have an interest and that they want to qualify as a practice educator through, as I was kind of saying, you know, support of students that might be in the team, support of, you know, in ASYEs, support of other kind of workers that are within within the team and that from both, at, you know, adults and, um, and children and that of who might be there and just really that development themselves of just saying that, yes, this is the course that they want to undertake. And that so they would then for any practice educate anybody who wants to come into practice education and that to, again it would change from each authority or be slightly different but with it for myself it's within workforce development undertake that's an interview process and that of and it, looking with the worker is this the right time for them to do practice education are they at the right level here is it what is going to enable them to progress forward but as importantly also for students to be able to move move forward and that they're at to the at that right point and that's a very much following along with what the peps and their requirements are as well um I think I am probably coming to the end and that so it's just really I would just promote and that of which we all are this t whole team the team support and that to practice education and the team including say workforce development our HEIs everybody working together for for the student and that coming into any team so I'm going to pass back to Laura and that on this point thank you thank you Angela um, so that's just really helpful um, insight around um, how workforce development and on an organisational level, we would look at the team around the student approach. And as we said at the beginning, each organisation may differ. So, for example, with Solihull, with the interview process, but it is helpful for an organisation to have a practice educator strategy or a practice educator handbook or guide um, which details these things. So what is the process and what is everyone's responsibility? Um, and it is helpful to include things uh, like um, that Rachel touched on ordering the laptops where does student claim mileage that sort of thing so there are different examples um, that as a teaching partnership we've looked at across the region um, as part of our practice education strategy working group um, so it's just helpful to take back sort of to look within your own organization what is that practice educator strategy and is there kind of a handbook or a guide that you could use as the team manager or whether you're a practice educator um, when facilitating student learning on the team so next we're going to hear from cheryl wall um program manager for the um west midland social work teaching partnership who's going to um, talk through being a learning organization so over to you cheryl Thanks, Laura. Morning, everybody. Um, so as Laura, as Laura says, I'm I'm now the programme manager for the, the teaching partnership, been in post since uh, June last year. Um, I'm a social worker as well and was a practice educator for, for many years and then moved into workforce development and held the job of uh, practice learning coordinator for some time and, um, and became a workforce development manager as well. I then worked for Skills for Care um, for about 15 years on, on social work projects. Um, I was seconded to a practice learning task force in um, 2002 to 2006. And when Laura asked me to, to give um, a presentation on learning organisations, I remembered some work that I did about 15 years ago with Peter Marsh who was a professor, professor from uh, Sheffield University, who'd done a lot of work on leadership and learning organisations. Uh, and when I was in the task force, we asked him to work with us when we were looking at promoting practice learning within local authorities. And he'd done some work with Sky on developing a learning uh, organisation resource pack which, which was to provide information on learning organisations and to support informed decision making. And we asked Peter to work with us and look at how those learn those self the, the self assessment resource pack, which comprised a number of cards that um, you know different workers within an organisation could use, could be linked to supporting um, practice learning teams. So I was really pleased to see that um, that resource is still on the Sky website. There's a little caveat saying that this this um, was produced in, in 2008. You need to check sort of the policy and practice as you know is is up to date on those um, those slides, the the cards. But um, 
when I look through them, I think they're still relevant. So uh, I'm just going to talk uh, briefly about a, a learning organisation. Um, you know, taking some of the um, some of the the information from that Sky um, self assessment resource pack, and then link it to what I think how it relates to having a student within um, within a team. So I'm sure many people will have heard of Peter Senji, um, who developed the, the concept of a learning organisation back in the in the 1990s. And it was all about systemic thinking. And as Peter Senji has said, and you, you can see some, some sort of short YouTube videos of him talking about a learning organisation if you do a, a search, which are really helpful. He speaks really, um, really clearly. Um, on learning organisations. So, so he talks about it being people working together at their best. Uh, he's produced a number of books and the fifth discipline is probably the, the, the one that people um, you know, know of best. So it's, it's about systemic thinking, about team working, about understanding complexity and about seeing the larger system and how it all goes together. In terms of the second point, um, learning of individuals is integrated into the whole. This is about learning dominating within an organisation, that the organisation cultivates an aspiration to learn you know, when it's, a, when it's an organisation and supports the development of others as well. So you've got shared responsibility to supporting the development of others. Um, it fosters reflection. So uh, Peter Senji talks about needing time to actually have those reflective conversations to think together to avoid making the same mistakes you know to learning from from those mistakes that have been made and it creates an infrastructure um an environment where people can share learning to reflect um and they can respond reflexively to to new challenges he talks about learning experiences being evaluated as well. So, and though the results from that evaluation can be incorporated into to planning future learning. So I provided um, the, the link to the resource pack at the bottom there. And I also um, referred to um, the Williams and Rutter Practice Educators Handbook as well in, in putting those points together. So onto the next slide, please, Adam. Um, so the features of the learning organisation on the, the left are taken from the, the Sky resource pack. And then I've made suggestions in terms of how it links to um, how offering student placements and, and how students can play a make a contribution to the development of a learning team within a learning organisation. And I think Peter Marr should say that um, learning teams are much easier to achieve than learning organisations. You can definitely aspire to be a learning organisation, but um, many of us who've been in social work for, for some years can look back over our career and think about those teams where there was a real buzz about learning, about you know, supporting each other, supporting the development of others. And, and quite often, in most cases, from, um, from my experience, that involved having students on a, on a regular basis. So the first point, <coughs> five features of the learning organisation. So the first one is around organisation, um, organisational structure. So the again from the Sky Pack, it's about you know, these. These are the words that they use: feedback from people using services and participation, actively sought, valued, and resourced, used to influence and inform practice. So obviously, students can model obtaining feedback from people with lived experience. You know, it, it, they need to do that as part of their, um, you know, to work towards their qualification. You know, to meet the um, evidence against the, the PCF. And, and I guess team members can think, are they obtaining feedback on a regular basis? You know, how are they using that? Um, how's the whole team using that to, to inform and develop their practice? Second point is a cross-organisational and collaborative working. 
and students can support that um, you know, during their induction process. It may be that even virtually students can link with other areas of the organisation. You know, they can they can feedback, they can question, they can think about how their team links to other teams within the organisation. Um, you know, what roles, responsibilities are, um, you know, how how work gets passed from one team to another. Um, so their point about team working, learning and making the, the best use of all staff skills that are integral to the to the organisation. And this is a, a common theme that's come through this this webinar. Um, you know that student support, um, you know, the whole team can be involved with um, supporting the student. So each team member has a unique set of skills and experience and knowledge. And, and this this can provide this will provide a, a rich source of learning you know for the for the student okay and so the next slide please so the second element is around organizational culture and the first point is about a system of shared beliefs values goals and objectives so this can provide an opportunity for that two-way exchange um, between the, the student, the practice educator and other members of the team as well um, in relation to what are the values, what's the belief, um, you know, what's important um, to the team. New ideas and methods are encouraged and this should be exactly what a student brings, you know, new ideas, learning from university, questioning, challenging, uh, and that should be encouraged and seen as a, an opportunity for for all members of the team, you know, to to think about, you know, what they're doing. Can they be doing things in a different way? What's working well? Um, you know, what could be developed further? The open learning environment allows learning from mistakes and the opportunity to test out innovative practice. So this is this is about thinking about considered risks. Um, so learning from students that are doing well um, and also, you know, as Helen was saying, students that have struggled, there is learning there. Um, you know, there will be questions if, if a student struggles, as Helen said, but you know, what learning can be gained from that? And not forgetting, you know, if students done really well, that as a whole team it can think about, OK, what what did we do well? This this was a really good experience for the whole team. Can we build on that? Can we really think about what was the, the environment, the setting, the context that um, the support, the individual contributions, the team contributions that actually made that a really good experience for the whole team? So the student can demonstrate an open learning opportunity and introduce new approaches. You, know, you can have those times for reflective conversations. You th can think together and think differently. OK, final slide, please, Adam. So in terms of information systems, which is the third feature of the, the learning organisation, then say that there needs to be in effective information systems for internal and external communication and policies and procedures are meaningful and understood by everybody. So discussing the rationale and meaning of information systems with a student, um, you know, with team members, with team managers, practice educators can help the whole of the team to understand, um, you know, why those policies and procedures are in place. Um, the students' questions can help clarify if they're fit for purpose or not. I mean, you can have some students that do question, you know, quite rightly, policies and, and procedures, um, and, and this can lead to, to thinking and rethinking and, and clarification of both formal and informal policies and procedures. In terms of human resources, um, continuous development for staff, including a clear supervision, um, and appraisal policy. So this is about opportunities for the, the practice educator for foreshadowing. Angela talked about um, you know, CP, it's, it's a, a CPD opportunity. I, th I think, sorry, it may, be, may have been um, an earlier speaker that talks about CPD opportunities for foreshadowing for the whole team. Um, and the practice educator students re relationship can model good supervision practice 
So, you know, supervision needs to be regular, you know, timely, you know, include opportunities for you know, really good quality reflection. And, and it includes observation and getting feedback on um, on observations as well. And I think that's sometimes something that we don't do enough of in, in social work, in terms of observation of your know, experienced social workers as well as, as students. Students and QSWs are used to being observed in practice, but then quite often um, it does fall apart. And I think that you know if, if you can carry on um, providing good quality feedback um, for regular observations, that can support everybody's you know, development. So the final point is around leadership. Um, that there's capacity for the organisation to change and develop services over and above day-to-day -day delivery. And students can undertake projects. Um, I know that the the um, placement contingency document that has been developed by the partnership looks at a range of products projects that can be undertaken by students if the placement cannot continue in the traditional way. And it, I mean, projects can also be undertaken by by students, um, you know, in sort of non-pandemic times as well. Um, you know, I, I know that they are. But um, they can undertake those projects with a fresh eyes perspective and, um, and offer suggestions for incremental improvements as well. So all members of the team have a, a leadership team in supporting the learning and the assessment of the student, providing feedback you know, when the student is progressing well. And as Helen was saying, actually being really clear about what the feedback is if, if, the, um, if the student is struggling as well. Okay, thanks and back to Laura. Thank you, Thank Cheryl. Cheryl. That, so that was so valuable in terms of um, creating that um, learning organisation. I know sort of as you were speaking, Cheryl, I was reflecting on my own experience as a practice educator being part of one of those learning teams. I think a very good learning team. I know some people um, from my team are here today, so that's really good. So we're going to go to the um, final speaker before we go on to the Mentimeter and the um, Q&A. So um, last but by um, no means least, um, we've got Joanne Lowe um, giving the, um, she's an AMP um, lead from Birmingham City Council, giving a team manager perspective. So over to you, Joanne. Morning, everybody. So um, as Laura says, my name is Joanne Lowe. Um, I'm a team manager, um, an approved mental health professional. I've been a practice educator, and I've been a practice mentor assessor as well for AMP candidates. I've been in social work for 21 years and I'm currently the AMP lead in Birmingham City Council. I also mentor um, students for Birmingham University and also um, supporting the Think Ahead programme for Birmingham City Council, which is a fast track programme for mental health students. So um, I'm here to talk to you about the benefits of hosting a student from um, the perspective of the team manager and, and trying to really encourage you to participate. Hosting students can make a significant contribution to your team and to your organisation, just as you've heard from my fellow speakers this morning. Students often work to quite a high standard and they can work on different types of projects depending on what your team and organisation's priorities are. So they can bring a lot of value to your team, not just as an extra pair of hands, as you've already heard, but also in terms of um, valuing their experience and leading them to do things that you may have wanted to do as a team, but you've not perhaps had time to do. As social workers and managers, we all learn from the people that we come across. So those that we help, we learn from our colleagues and we learn from our partners. Supervising a placement student will help your staff to develop their own teaching and mentoring skills. So this is particularly useful, as you've heard from colleagues today, around those staff who are looking to gain management experience and for staff who want to enhance their coaching and mentoring skills and for those who have got a passion for sharing their learning as well. As a team manager, when you're starting to consider whether to host a student and whether this is right for your team, I would encourage you to start the discussions at your team meetings. You're going to be the best placed person to know your staff group. You'll have a good idea about those staff who may be ready to develop into practice educators and um, you will face pressures, particularly at the moment with COVID, and you may think I can't release 
um, my social workers out into to practice education because they're going to be out of the chain for a while. Um, I understand that pressure only too well, but you need to sort of balance that um, against the benefits of releasing your staff to train, um, which will obviously, it'll, the benefits will outweigh the short term impact of having them out of the team doing their training. So when you have made the decision to host a student in your team, I would encourage you to think about how you might facilitate the student's placement. So by that, I would ask you to think about the environment. Um, I know currently working from home from your spare room or garden shed like I am, that's your new office. Um, but when we do go back to offices, um, think about how that environment is for a student coming in for the first time. It might be their first time actually coming into a professional environment such as a, a social work office and it can be quite intimidating. So think about um, practical issues. So um, desk spaces and chairs and meeting the needs of students who may require reasonable adjustments such as specialist equipment to enable their learning experience. Some organisations such as ours have a student work zone or a student unit. Um, that's a good opportunity to hold materials and resources. So student library, for instance, a uh, bank of desks where students can come together and, and, and share understandings, particularly in organisations who take um, a high volume of students on an annual basis. From your perspective as a team manager, you are the head of your team and you are leading your team and you, you are responsible for developing your team's culture. It, in order to be an encouraging environment for students, it's, it's good for you to introduce be, to be introduced to the student uh, prior to the, their starting on the placement. So when they come in to perhaps have a look around the organisation, that's a good time really. Um, it's, it's, it's a less formal time for them to come in and just be introduced to you um, and just to understand some of the power dynamics in the team. Um, and it as helps establish a professional boundaries from the outset and it lets them see you um, as a team leader and you know, hopefully would encourage them to, to feel valued and part of your team before they even start. I'm just going to move on to talking about um, some of the supervision aspects um, and, and your role in that. So we all know that reflective practice and supervision um, are essential aspects of social work and you'll need to include um, student supervision as an agenda on your um, staff supervision sessions. So if you are responsible for supervising your staff, have that practice educator element and student element within that supervision. You need to consider the impact um, on the practice educator on their workload. I know other colleagues have touched on this today. Um, a reduced caseload uh, would enable the practice educator to give more time to their student. And again, I understand the pressures in the service, but often the practice educator will be supporting the student and, and taking on more casework through their caseload as well. So um, in some ways, it, it, it will enable you to sort of work through um, other aspects of work as well. But um, please, you know, look at the impact on that practice educator, all the other responsibilities that they've got going on as well. Encourage your team to offer shadowing opportunities and to be inclusive to the student. There's nothing worse than having a team that's quite sort of close together and they're, they're not really encouraging of having other people coming in. So it's good from the outset to have that culture whereby you are inclusive and you bring people in. Um, students have different needs and they have different um, experiences um, of developing their professional skills. So some of this might be their tone of communication, for instance. Um, they may not have experience working in a professional environment before. They might sort of be uh, fairly new out of school, college, etc. And this is something very new to them. So placing them in a space with your team it is vital for their learning because it enables boundary setting. It enables them to, to learn from others. It supports reflective discussion and planning. So if they've got a, um, an issue which comes up, perhaps having a difficult telephone call, things can be dealt with very quickly and there's the team around them in order to support them with those difficulties. So discussions and planning can be facilitated by observing other staff, as I say, so it's important for the students learning to be able to learn from other staff and to watch them. So this might be as simple as um, guidance and answering emails or um, appropriately addressing service users and colleagues in a professional environment. The benefits of hosting a student to your team are what makes the investment in getting this right at the start really worth it. Um, one thing I've noticed is students reduce the average age of your team, sometimes by as much as 10 years. They bring a fresh perspective 
they encourage your team to reflect on their own practices and on your organisational processes and are at the forefront of research and case law, obviously being fresh from university and I say we all learn from each other. These are the workforce of the future. So by hosting students, you're increasing the opportunities for young people in your area and also you can shape them in the kind of practitioner you would want in your service so that you develop employable and confident social workers at the end of the placement who are ready to join you in your ASYE programme if you're running one. Inevitably, as you've heard today, um, things don't always go well and I could sit here and tell you all morning about some of the horror stories that we've had in our organisation around students. But having a um, placement learning agreement at the outset um, and having um, an understanding with the practice tutor early on will help you to, to look at those issues and to hopefully forestall them. Something that you could look at, we've talked a lot about feedback today, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we do in our area. Uh, and I was interested in what Helen was saying about those um, courageous conversations. We call them crunchy conversations in my organisation. Um, make of that what you will, but that's what we call them. And um, one of the um, models that we use for feedback is the aid model. So this is something that you might want to look at and encourage your PAs to use. So it's a way of offering honest feedback, uh, which is useful in having those difficult, crunch conversations. Um, it depersonalises the issue and it focuses on the main area of difficulty. It provides a simple structure for giving feedback and it breaks feedback into three simple stages. So these are actions, so the things that someone has said or done well or poorly, and that can also be known as the process. Um, the impact, so what's the impact or effect it had on you, your colleague, the task, the team, sometimes known as the end result, and the desired action, so the things that someone could do to achieve a positive outcome or result, and the things that you could do to improve performance. So it really is a sort of rounded um, way of giving feedback rather than just giving a negative feedback and just leaving it hanging. It, it's a way of sort of wrapping that up and actually achieving something tangible at the end of it. it encourages the student to give feedback on their feedback. So it's not just a one way process where you, you give a bit of negative feedback. It encourages the um, receiver to reflect on that feedback and then to feedback to you how that, how that felt to them so that you, you're both learning. And this might be something that you can discuss with your practice educator. Um, and I've asked Laura to um, give details of the aid model and a lot more detail as a learning resource. So she'll share that with you as part of this session. The placements a learning partnership arrangement between the student and the practice educator, as you've, you've heard today. And the tutor, um, their role is a third party to monitor and where necessary to come in and facilitate and troubleshoot. And as the team manager, there may be times when you're asked to join these meetings um, to support your practice educator or to mediate in, in circumstances of particular difficulty. Hosting a student can be emotionally overwhelming for both the student and the practice educator, especially in the early days. So you often get anxiety if you tears, tantrums, whatever. So be prepared to be there to offer support to your staff. Often bringing the student into the team meetings and encouraging them in um, team building sessions, social activities, etc. are all ways to make them feel valued and to make them feel part of the wider team and to get the best out of them and the best out of the placement. Finally, remember, it's an opportunity for you and your team to develop the learning of others and to develop the future of social work. So if you are considering to take that first leap, I would encourage you to go for it and I just hope that you won't regret it. Thank you. Uh, back to Laura. Thanks, Thanks Joanne. Joanne. And, and as you said, I'm going to share the um, um, model of um, feedback when we share the slides and um, all the references will be in the um, slides. So if you if everybody can go to um, menti.com, it's on the screen now. Um, I believe you can just click the link, but you can type it, um, type it into a web browser and use the um, code that's on the screen now so um 9923089 um and adam will shortly um put that onto the screen um just when everybody's um 
managed to get the code um, and we've just got two questions um, on there before we go to the q and a i have seen um, some questions come up in the chat which is really great so if you have got any questions um, i really encourage you to put those into the chat now so we can ask the presenters that are here today um, we will get through as many of those as possible um, any outstanding questions we can um, try and answer um, in writing and when we send out the slides um, so if you can go to um, menti.com or oh, I think some people are already answering the um, questions so that's good so the overall majority is still remaining um, confident um, and very confident so I'm not sure so um, no one's feeling um, not confident so that's very reassuring. Um, we've got about 50, 50 plus people and we've got 28 people um, have answered. So if anybody um, hasn't, oh, that number's just going up. So someone has put a hand up. I don't know if that's about um, the Mentimeter. I don't have a... Um anything to be able to give feedback. I don't even have a chat. You haven't got a chat or anything? No. Nope. <laughs> what what device are you using? A laptop. Oh, and do you use Microsoft Teams usually? Yeah. I'm not sure why that is the case, Carolyn. Um, I'm Carolyn, the same what? as well. Uh, along the top, that. do you have, do you have um, Two sort of uh, emo like emoji type looking things. There's like two people, a high yes, a conversation yes. box. If you click on the conversate like the um, box that looks like a speech bubble, that should bring you I, into the chat. I don't have that. I just have the um, the people that showing the participants. I've got the three dots, but I can't see anything on there. Um, I don't have. I've, I've had that trouble as well. Sorry about that everybody so if you if you um have got a question at the end please um put your hand up and we can come to you with your questions someone's after. just mentioned that they, that they left and came back um and then it worked so i'm not sure if that would help i'll do that then thanks okay so some people say in the chat they can't um access the mentimeter but they're feeling confident so that's good so I think we've got about 36 people. So shall we move on um, to the next question? Which this one will ask you to input some words. So um, three words that will best describe your confidence level. Um, so whether at this point, oh, Carolyn is just rejoining. Whether at this point you feel um, informed by today's session, um, inspired, sort of excited to move on, um, in terms of facilitating student placements or you know whatever word you um, wish to choose waiting for the first response just let people back in who are rejoining who can't seem to see the chat oh, that's working now caroline good that's good news So some really good words here. So informed, I think the bigger the word, the more people have said that. So informed um, seems like quite um, and motivated. They they um, seem like quite popular choices. And um, we've got confident, clear, um, eager. Someone's point keeps moving when I'm reading it. Um, or someone said I'm not in a team. So that's interesting. Whether we could pick that up in the Q and A if that's a particular. Um, someone's apprehensive as well so we've got a mixed response which is um good but um really pleased that we've been able to deliver this session and that people um feel mostly motivated informed and enthusiastic that's um that's good for us in terms of immediate feedback but we will um complete an evaluation prepared oh some great words i like this mentimeter if you can't tell <laughs> Uh, 
just letting some people back in. So just give this a few more minutes. I can see 28 people have answered, so less than the previous question. Maybe you're thinking of really um, some good words, but it's as you'll see, it's refreshing constantly. So people are always filling this in. And we can share this along with the slides because, um, you, you know, you can upload this as a CPD um, and you'll be able to have this um, just as a um, as something to take away from the session today. So we've got about 32 people. I think that was about the same as before. So um, supported new ideas, fulfilled. I'm just reading some of the smaller ones. Um, clarified karma. That's a good one. Will someone feel the same? Karma um, and progression. They're really great words. So, so thank you so much for that. So we're going to go to the um, Q and A now. So Adam's going to feed through the questions that have already been asked um, earlier. Um, please feel free to keep asking questions if you've got any um, questions that you didn't ask when the speaker, um, you know, when that particular person was presenting. Um, and we will um, ask the question to the most appropriate um, person on the panel. OK, yes, yeah, so the first um, questions that came in were earlier on during um, Helen's original conversation and people were sort of um, interested to understand more why males and people from BAME groups struggle more. So I don't know if Helen can um, point us to particular research around this, but yeah. I just wanted to ad address a point around, um, so we, we know it, diversity is very important and um, we recognise that actually as a, as a um, panel of presenters today, we're, we're not the most diverse um, group. So um, a lot of people on the um, panel, well, everyone on the um, panel is um, a white female, which we know is not very representative, but this has been um, this session has been bought from the um, practice education strategy working group that um, and across the whole teaching partnership and has been um, discussed at program board, which is a very diverse, you know, a partnership organisation. Um, so this session has been informed through many um, different um, people um, bringing different perspectives, um, but we absolutely recognise that um, the presenters today, yes, actually don't represent such a diverse group. But Helen's going to um, answer this question about research around um, yeah. failing students. Well, let me just see if I can find the question again. Um, I'll scroll up the chat. Um, I think people are saying they were interested in why that yeah. was the case or to sort of point to and particular I, research. Yeah, I think um, it was one of those things that were kind of there wasn't quite enough time to really do that section justice, really. Um, and I think what I wanted to kind of, sort of say is, yes, we have a very diverse range of students. Um, our students come from all sorts of life experiences. Um, and it can be a challenge, particularly for academic staff um, to, I guess, to try and make sure that we are um, supporting everybody uh, in their own individual ways whilst trying to kind of standardise assessments and things like that. Um, so have a look. So. If you're looking for some research, um, particularly um, if we think about start with males, um, I've sort of done and started with that um, males in his question. Um, there's some research by Jason Shaw, I think from 2015, um, that looks at progression of males in social work. And what he was saying is um, there are some limitations to his research. Um, but what he was saying is that, that male students tend to either defer, withdraw, they may fail academically or placements might be kind of a, a challenge for them as well. Um, so there are a range of reasons. It's not just placements that are. Um, uh, so SHUB is um, S-C-H-A-U-B. Um, so just for pick up on the question there. Um, I'll try and put some. I'll, I'll, when we're finished, I'll try and put some kind of um, references in um, for you to have a look at. Um, and I noticed Laura's just put one in the chat there from Prosper to Dam as well, who's done a lot of um, research around working with students from um, BA, ME um, backgrounds and also Angie Bartoli's work as well. That was one um, of the participants, Helen, sorry to interject. But oh, just sorry. Saying, um, sorry one that. Thank you so much to whoever the person. Who yeah. So again, I'll, um, I can put some kind of links to different kind of texts there. Um, 
What I would say, if you're interested in males particularly, and you've got some time, I think tomorrow night, this the I know Siobhan McLean's been doing some Student Connect um, work. And if you've got a male student on your team and their topic for tomorrow night is actually ma males in social work. So um, do have a look at this the Social Work Student Connect. It, usually those sessions, I think, are recorded and, and made available later. So if you're not available, then you might be able to pick up on that later. Um, but there's certainly, you know, um, an event tomorrow night as well, which um, I can ask um, or if, um, so if there's other questions that other people are looking at, I can see if I can find a link to it and put that in the chat. Um, so, yes, um, I think um, it's difficult if you're looking at um, what support universities are putting in place, certainly with BAME um, and um, post Black Lives Matter last summer as well, we're very much looking at what we're calling decolonising the, the curriculum. And I think that goes across all universities are looking at and all subject areas, not just social work, to think about, you know, what type of research are we using? Whose research are we using? Are we looking at authors from different ethnic backgrounds or are we just looking at white Western perspectives? So really thinking about, you know, how are we kind of encouraging our students to read more widely across different aspects of research? Um, so, so there's um, a, a range of different things that we are doing. I think with males in social work particularly, that can be a challenge because actually one of the reasons that people struggle, or males do struggle there, is actually they are very much outnumbered in the group. Um, you know, we can end up with, you know, just a handful of male students or in some cases just one male student in a whole group of female um, students. So, and it varies year on year. So what we're certainly trying to do is encourage um, a student kind of society that will kind of get all year groups mixing. So at least there's a little bit more, a um, little bit more kind of going on um, across the whole department. But again, with COVID and things being more remote, that has been more of a challenge. I, say, I can't speak for the universities on that, but I know that's just some of the things that we are doing. Um, so I think that Daniel DP again, an additional mentor. Yeah, I mean, we've certainly got male staff on the team as well. Um, but yeah, if there's an additional mentor or there's another male in social work um, around that they could speak to if there's a female practice educator and female work based supervisor, but there's another male on the team or on a, on a um, neighbouring team, that can be really helpful to allow that student to tap into. Um, OK, does that answer those questions for those people? I will put some research um, links uh, up for you to have a look at if you're interested in looking at that more. Um, I don't know that anybody's got the answers particularly as to how we address this, but certainly, you know, I think there's lots of university um, that we're trying to definitely promote a lot more diversity and support and understanding why some of these challenges are happening. Well, thank you, Helen. That's so helpful. And I think the links from from the chat generally, I think people are saying the links will be helpful um, and other things. Um, so um, Jackie's just putting in the chat about the university um, social society um, to promote this as well. So, and there's a lot of work going on across the teaching partnership um, around um, decolonising social work programmes, and um, I think those research links will really help be helpful. So, Adam. Yeah. And so there, there was a, another question that came up during Joanne's um, presentation from Balvinda, um, and it is: Will the role of social work education be included in the review announced by Gavin Williamson? Would there be consideration to reintroduce payments to practice educators who undertake additional responsibilities? So if, if I can start by answering the second part of that um, question. So I know across the teaching partnership, this is what I was alluding to around different practice education strategies. Um, so this will be very much around each individual organisation and what their approach is to practice education. So payments of practice educator do vary um, across the country, but um, you know within our region, and that's something that as a teaching partnership we're aspiring to, aspiring to have consistency over. Um, so to to look at um, each organisation's practice education strategy and what support, including um, payment, is offered to practice education. Um, so. I'm just looking towards, so I hope that answers that part of the question around um, payment um, for practice educators, sort of what's happening now. Um, I don't, I'm just looking to the other um, presenters today around the first part of the question around the review by Gavin Williamson. So I'm not too sh sure myself, I'm totally honest, if that's going to include um, practice education. I don't, I don't know if any of the other presenters are. Um, if not, then I'm, I'm sure that's something that we can find out, especially as the um, view progresses. 
So anybody else got any other thoughts on that? Just sorry, just very briefly, when I've looked at the review, I couldn't see that it was included in practice education at this point. But again, we will have to kind of, um, yeah, we need to get more more information about that. And uh, so ap apologies, I don't have any more. So um, was it Bevinda asked that question? Sorry, we couldn't give um, couldn't um, give more of a detailed answer regarding that. Laura, can I can I just say that I, I do know that um, the Department of Education are looking at practice education separately, though, and they are developing a working group to look at practice education and and placements. So that that may be done separately um, from the review. I know it's it's been a big um, discussion point within the national network of teaching partnerships and being taken you know, very seriously what the, the concerns are in relation to valuing and and supporting um, practice educators and making sure that we have the right supply of quality placements. Thanks, Cheryl. Great. So is that um, so? I think that sort of moves on to the next question um, from Jenna. Jenna asked, she said, we have a first year student starting, usually have a third year and feel less confident on what work they should be undertaking without expecting too much. Also, that's a really good question. I suppose that could be answered from various um, perspectives. So I don't know if um, from a HGI point of view and from um, sort of a team manager and a practice educator, we can construct a joint response. Don't know. Rachel, Rachel, you look like you had something there. <laughs> yeah, that was, I say something. Yeah, I'd spotted that question, so I thought I'd jump in. Yeah, so my student that I'm working with at the moment, she well, technically she's a second year student, but it's the first placement. So she'd done she's a Keel student, so they do a three day placement in the first year, and the second year they do a 70 day placement. So that's what she's doing. And um, yeah, we don't normally have students at that level in the local authority. Um but because of the current situation and uh, things like day services and stuff not really being open, um, we, we did offer to take a couple of um, centre day students. And um, yeah, so we sort of talked about, oh, well, they can do a lot of reading, they can do a lot of shadowing and that sort of thing. But but actually, they still need to be assessed on something. You still need to do three direct observations. So um, I think what I did was sat down and kind of did a bit of a mind map of what what learning opportunities we had available and uh, also looked at the PCFs and what level they need to have reached by the end of the first placement. So using that as a sort of benchmark that helped me to kind of work out what we needed to do. And then um, so she has done. So as I said, I work with adults and older people. So she has done quite a few reviews. We tried to make that as diverse as possible. So it's not just all older people in care homes or, or anything like that. Um, and then um, she has sort of kind of she's been able to as we've gone on, she's done some assessments So over Christmas. Um, and this is what I was referring to. I got the balance right with my team manager in that she uh, she knew what her learning needs were. She did actually give her a rapid response case where the person was having rapid response for two weeks and we needed to kind of move things on. And she she having got had all the previous experience and done all the observations and stuff she was able to rise to that so to an extent it's it's a tricky one because you think oh what can we do so it is kind of keeping to the perhaps the more simplest stuff but you need to bear in mind that in another year they're going to be doing more complex stuff and then after that they're going to be going into practice <laughs> hopefully um so yeah it's kind of starting perhaps quite simple trying to get as many shadowing opportunities as you can and that is quite difficult because not everybody i found not everybody was using teams to do reviews where well, i've been using that um and increasingly so have we've gone on so people didn't know how to to offer that shadowing opportunity um but yeah sort of perhaps start with the pcfs think through what they need to be able to achieve think about what you could offer as direct observation so we we've unfortunately you're running out of time so we've got one this afternoon and then one tomorrow which isn't what you'd normally plan to do but the one tomorrow is she's going to speak at the team meeting she's going to do a bit about strength-based practice um and just about the theories and stuff behind it so um that's given her a bit of research to do and um it means that i can observe her doing that and that you that will hit pcf9 uh, and also i did i have asked in advance for the team some members of the team to 
to give me feedback after after the team meeting as well um so that was um, a few people did respond which is great so um that should be good um so yes i don't know if that helps but it, it does feel daunting to begin with but there are lots of things that you can do obviously i'm working with adults if it's a children's team then i'm probably going to be less helpful to you no, that, I think that's really helpful. Obviously, I'm not sure if it's an adult or a children's um, team, Rachel, but I was just thinking as you were speaking as well, what a great opportunity for the student. I think more um, now with um, student placement challenges, as those um, partners that are involved um, in those conversations well know with um, a lot of level five placements um, and PVI sector placements now aren't possible. Um, a lot more students are having a statutory placement um, during that second year or first year if it's an MA um, and, and that is really good um, in terms of transitioning then into the um, final year. So I do hope um, that answered the question. And I think that's um, what I would say, Rachel, in terms of linking it back um, to the PCF. Um, um, Laura, sorry, um, Jenna came on to say it was for children's. Ah, uh, so for children's. Um, so I think the same, um, also someone else is putting in the chat there around um, using genograms and chronologies um, and other people saying to look at um, the PCF. Um, so I hope that um, is helpful in terms of answering the question there. So any other questions? So I, think, I think we've got time for this last one. So um, from Carolyn Lynch says there are a lot of locums who can support the students, but we lack opportunities due to short contracts. I'm one such PE and I have a full award. So I wonder if this is um, whether Carolyn is um, aiming this towards a HEI perspective. Um, so from an employer point of view, that would obviously depend on the practice education strategy of that um, of that organisation, but whether there be opportunity for independent practice education work. Helen, I don't know if um, you can offer anything for this question. Yeah, Just I mean, I think Liz, sorry, sorry, I was going to jump in there. And um, yeah, I was going to say, um, certainly most um, universities, I think, have a pool of independent practice educators that they draw upon. So I guess it would depend on your time commitments and whether you felt you could actually do um, the agency work you're doing alongside an additional role as um, an off-site practice educator, often that will be with first placement students in voluntary sector organisations where there isn't a social worker on site. Um, but sometimes um, local authorities will um, ask um, for independent um, practice educators where perhaps they can provide a placement but haven't got the practice educator support for that. Um, I think, you know, I, I mean, it might be one for Angela if she might want to sort of come in from a local authority perspective really as well. You know, if actually it's about how do I have a student within the team in which I'm currently placed as an as a local um, social worker, I think, you know, it might be down to individual ones, but there might be a local authority perspective on that that I'm not able to give, um, which Angela might be able to. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. And that, I would actually reiterate like what you're saying, though, every local authority is so different. And uh, so I think it would probably we would encourage if you were lo low coming that to go independent, be an independent practice educator, because I have to say at this point and that we I, I very much encourage that. Um, yeah, it's uh, full fully em employed people within within Solihull who are practice educators practice educators but I know that every authority is different and it will work differently for other other authorities but unfortunately I can't give all those all those perspectives I'm afraid <laughs> and that but hopefully in that it's great that you're continuing to be a practice educator and I would hope that we can use your services and that is the main main part of it of what we're wanting to do and that's a thank you. Yeah, thanks, Angela. That's a key part of our practice education strategy around actually not only how we um, train new new practice educators but how we retain those practice educators who have those qualifications and skills and um, eagerness by the sounds of it Carolyn to actually continue with that role um, you know we want to be able to retain as many practice educators as possible um, across the region even those that Angela mentioned earlier that do go on to progress that they're still able to fulfill that role um, as much as possible and to maintain that currency of um, undertaking activity once every two years. So Adam I don't know if there's any further um, no, I think that's, questions. I think everything on there today. 
thank so I just want to say on behalf of the teaching partnership, thank you so much for for everyone who attended um, and engaged um, in the um, Q and A there and um, in the Mentimeter. I really do hope you found it um, useful and you're taking a lot away. I know that. Um, hearing um, Sarah's insight as a student around um, how they can feel more involved in a team and not be referred to as the student um, and you know all the perspectives um, from Rachel, Joanne, Helen, Angela and um, from all the various perspectives about what we can all do to um, facilitate student learning and to make that a really good opportunity. Um, so and so I'd also like to, on behalf of the teacher partnership, thank the presenters that have been involved. Um, so as I said, this has been um, pulled together a real collaborative approach um, through the various working groups that we have. Um, and it has been pulled together quite quickly, um, but I think um, it came together well as a session. So thank you so much everyone for attending and um, we'll send out all the slides and references afterwards. Um, and I hope to see you at future teaching partnership events. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Thank thanks, Laura. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Someone's got some like playing out music. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure who that is, but it's nice. <laughs> mm.